Rob, I have to say the the think small, act big definitely was in that land for me for the last two weeks. Very good. Um, spent a lot of time thinking about it. It's so counterintuitive. It's so uh, like it's 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 against everything that's kind of fed to you, isn't it? Like it's it's the keep your dreams small kind of stuff, like you know. But it's uh, yeah, certainly in relation to that those, that five k running, Rob. But like you're going to need to stop posting your times because you're you're killing me. Like, <laughs> they've gone good. up. They've gone up. I've kind of stopped in the last week or so. Um, <clears throat> no, it's interesting. I think from talking to different clients and stuff over the last while as well, the the mindset of setting very short-term goals going through this crisis has been hugely important for, for employees and that as well. So, you know, kind of just keeping week-to-week goals rather than long-term because you can lose heart very quickly. So not just yeah. personally, but professionally as well. Yeah, no, it's been a real, a real sort of a, a moment of insight for me anyway. Well, that's at least you're the, that one person that had so, took something from it. That's that's important. Yeah. So, John, do you want do you want to introduce your your uh, book for the evening? And we, yeah. we get no problem. Um, so, uh, thanks, Declan, Rob. Um, I'll follow what you did the last couple of weeks. So, I'll just talk about the when I read it and and what it meant, and and then uh, the author and go through the book. So, it's not like. So it's not like- the books you guys had where it would have lessons and you know advice for life but, but I took something out of it and I might have some lessons at the end so um, the I started a, a reading journal in 2015 so I just make a note of all the books I read and the, the this isn't on it so I must have read it before 2015 uh, and it's called The New New Thing so it's by Michael Lewis and my copy is 2012, so I must have read it around 2013, 2014. Mm. And I don't remember what I was doing when I read it, unlike Rob and his trip to Poland. And I don't, I don't remember it having any impact on me. But when, Declan, you asked me why I picked it, but when I went to look at the list of books and stuff, it just came, something in subconsciously must have stuck. So um, um, it was a good one. So it's by Michael Lewis. Uh, I've talked about them before. So there's the Michael Lewis books. You're all familiar with Moneyball and Big the, Short. the Big Short and Flash Boy. So he's got a great uh, he's got a great uh, way of taking a complicated uh, subject like the collateralized debt obligations in, in the Big Short or uh, the uh, electronic stock markets and stuff. And he but he what he does is he normally picks a person. And he, he can tell their story and how they, you know, found their way through this complicated thing. So, this book is about a guy called Michael. Lew- uh, sorry, not Michael Lewis. That's the author, Jim Jim Clark. I'm just curious. Has anyone heard of Jim Clark before? I picked this book or before Rob told you? No. Yeah. So, when you hear his story, you'll be surprised that you've never heard of him. So, it, uh, this book kind of fills a gap in a history. Has anyone read this book, Accidental Empires, or heard of it? This tells us the story of the early days of Silicon Valley. So Hewlett Packard, um, Steve Jobs and Wozniak, how they built Apple. Xerox uh, were there, weren't they? Xerox Park, yeah, all mm-hmm. that stuff. It's about the birth of the personal computer. The book was published in 92. Yeah, 92, so it's 30 years old. Mm. Uh, and you can read about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and all these guys in the early days about the personal computers. Uh, and they made a TV show called Triumph of the Nerds. It's on YouTube. I saw that. It was, yeah, it was a Channel 4 documentary not, not sh- shortly after the book was published. Mm. But it tells that story of the, those early <laughs> nerds. Um, and then this one is, coincidentally, accidental as well. Accidental billionaires. You've all seen this. It's, it, became it became social media. It's about the uh, birth of Facebook Zuckerberg, the Winklevoss twins and all that. So that book was published 10 years ago. So 30 years ago, hardware. 10 years ago, social media, where where we are today, Bezos and so on. But this one was published, imagine, 20 years ago, uh, 99. So just over 20 years ago. And it tells the story of the birth of the internet. So how we got from the hardware to the social media through the internet. And this guy, James Clark, so he's a 
he's still alive. Um, why it's so surprising that people don't know his name? I don't know. He, like Elon Musk is famous for having created three billion dollar companies. Um, mm-hmm. No, it's questionable whether he founded PayPal or whether he founded Tesla because he kind of came in early, but he did definitely drive the growth of those companies. Um, and he's claimed that people think he's the only one, but James Clark built three. He was the only person before Elon Musk to build, found, and properly found from scratch three billion dollar companies. Uh, he was born in Texas, had a troubled family. His parents, his father was uh, troublesome. Parents divorced, went to school, got in trouble at school, uh, left early, went to join the Navy, got in trouble in the Navy. Uh, he didn't understand the multiple choice questions at the start, and he was put in a kind of a low-ranking uh, class. And um, when he finished in the Navy, he uh, he went to college and started – oh, sorry, in the Navy, it, they discovered he was actually a mathematical genius. They actually started him teaching um, – he went to college he quickly got a, a degree in maths and a master in physics and a phd in computer science and he worked in stanford and he invented this chip that develops or that 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 uh, can make 3d graphics so everything that we know today about jurassic park computer games uh 3D goggles, that all comes from uh, the, the, the patents that he invented in Stanford. And he founded a company called Silicon, Silicon Graphics. Silicon Graphics. Um, and that became his first billion dollar company. It was, uh, again, as I said, it, 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 it um, did for Hollywood you know, what they couldn't do before. Uh, it started to, the airplane manufacturers were using it for designing airplanes, and the car manufacturers were using it. Um, but the uh, the key the book is called the new new thing because this guy was restless like he could not stay still he wanted to find the next thing uh, and he moved on from Silicon Graphics actually he he suffered at the hands of the venture capitalists he he didn't get his fair share of that company uh, he didn't make a billion himself but the company went on to be a billion dollar company uh, so he kind of gritted his teeth and said I'm not going to let that happen again and he went off and said what's the next big thing. And these are all, this is in the mid 90s, now the, between 93 and the late 90s. Um, so he said the internet, the internet was there. It was a connection of computers. It was, a, it was rudimentary. And he said, how do we get people to use the internet and travel around the internet? So he found a young guy called Mark Andreessen and they, they created Netscape. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you remember Netscape, it was before Internet Explorer and it was the first browser really to hit the, like, there had been browsers, but it was the first one to go commercial. Um, and the, f- the interesting thing about the Netscape story is, oh, sorry, I'm going to skip the start. Michael Lewis, as I said, he always introduces the person and he normally meets the person and, you know, spends a lot of time with them. So the, the book starts with the, the sailing ship, Jim Clark sailing ship, the Hyperion. It was a, the biggest sailing ship, the biggest sloop. I don't know. I know nothing about sailing, but I know I read about the sloop. It has one sail. This had the tallest sail in the world. It was the biggest sloop in the world. And the sail was only limited by the fact that he, it had to go under the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> so he said, how tall is the Golden Gate Bridge? And let's make it that tall. And uh, he was designing this boat, this sloop and he programmed computers he took 24 of his silicon graphics computers and he wanted to design a boat that could sail itself uh and he did all the programming himself that he learned himself he learned how to program but he wanted to build this boat it was costing hundreds of millions so he forced his board and all his uh company in netscape netscape to go for an ipo too soon but he got lucky and netscape was floated and it made him a billion uh personally and he bought his boat or built his boat. He used to fly across to Amsterdam from San Francisco to Amsterdam every month to meet the builder for about two years and help them design it and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And then um, got bored with Netscape very quickly and he uh, decided he wanted to change. He said, what's the next, what's the new thing? What am I going to do? He decided he wanted to change the American healthcare system. Now we all know that's almost impossible, right? It's a very complex uh process but it was at the time it was 1.5 trillion dollars and it was the biggest 
market in America, the healthcare system. And he decided that he was going to put build a company that would connect doctors, patients, insurance companies, and good companies, and uh, streamline the whole thing and make it cheaper and just collect money along the way every time there's a transaction. Every time there was a prescription, every time there was a consultation, he wanted to get involved. And he created a company called Healthion, which um, uh, that one, yeah, the, the IPO failed because there was a crash in the 90s due to Russia defaulting on debts or something, and the IP, everyone got cold feet. Um, but the IPO went ahead later, and that company uh, went and became another billion-dollar company. So, um, And the whole time he was building these boats, I, I, well, the story is about his one boat because it took a few years to build. Um, but he kind of changed how, like he more or less invented the browser. So he more or less changed how the internet works. Um, never mind what he did with the 3D graphics. Um, they reckon his involvement in Healthion was um, changed how venture capital worked because in the late 90s, they were talking about the risk temperament of investors and how you know the European banks and the Swiss banks were very risk averse and then you had the Wall Street guys were more risk they had more appetite for risk but they were still very stuffy American businessmen and then you had the San Francisco VCs who were more likely to invest in a you know a computer company or a software company so when the IPO fell through Healthy on needed 40 million to survive the next six months and the capitalist said no way and he said, because he had so much money from Netscape, he said, don't worry, I'll, I'll fund it myself. And they all said, okay, if he's funding it and he's so successful and he knows what's going on, we better get involved. So they, they said, okay, we will fund it. So the venture capitalists came back and funded it. And they reckon that that was the first time that they funded something that had losses, no hope of the future. You know, it, it, it was, they were investing huge money in like a dream and in a kind of a, a potential. And because uh, uh, he had this kind of, he was an icon at that stage, like that he could do no wrong. So um, uh, he went from there. He again got bored, uh, left. Now Healthion didn't succeed as it, as he had hoped. It didn't become the the company that saved the healthcare system. But uh, he went on after that, and he founded a few other companies, my CFO, and uh, he got involved in home automation companies and uh, charity work and so on so uh, um, but let me think now is there something else incidentally that he, oh yeah oh yeah he was the one that um, Netscape oh, sorry Microsoft came to Netscape and said let us invest in you let us let us buy shares in Netscape like huge uh, shareholding in Netscape so because um, they knew Netscape was ahead of the game in browsers and uh, and they said, if you don't, we will stop you having access to our API. So they would literally cut off Netscape from you know, the back end of, micro, of Windows, and they would hamper them. So it was Jim Clark who rang the Department of Justice and said, Microsoft is abusing its monopoly and kicked off that whole antitrust uh, cork uh, that happened. So, um, no, it's just a fascinating story. Um, a part of history that maybe got forgotten as i said you know soon after that you had the the dot com bubble then soon after that you had the zuckerbergs and bezos and coming along and change, google changing the game and uh this guy got forgotten so um there was some interesting numbers i took down there from the around the time that those companies were in action they were pointing at amazon as having um 87 million dollars a quarter turnover and I looked it up, and today Amazon is turning over eighty billion dollars a quarter. So that's mm -hmm. <laughs> a thousand times more. At that time, Microsoft had thirteen billion dollar turnover a year, and today Microsoft has one hundred twenty five one hundred twenty five billion. Yeah, so it's a hundred times more. So, uh, like the numbers at that point were crazy numbers, and now they're even gone off the scale. Mm. So, um. Reading at that time, it must, as I said, it must have struck a chord with me, and and uh, uh, something in my subconscious must have stayed with me. So uh, the lessons I think I took on board, maybe 
maybe subconsciously and now reading it again kind of and for tonight trying to verbalize them there's three of them the first one is um <clears throat> the new new thing so that that was you could see from his story he was never satisfied with what he was doing he always had something ahead whether it was the boat or whether it was the next company or whether it was to some next choice and um i think that's important personally i i i'm very goal driven uh and I study uh, part-time, and I, I like that because you get uh, a course can be broken down to semesters, can be broken down to modules, can be broken down to assignments, and you have all these things. But um, it's maybe it resonated with me because I already do it. Maybe it influenced me, but I'm always, you always have to have the next goal in your mind because there's no point keeping your head down and finishing something and then looking up and being lost or having missed something else. So I always keep that in mind, even at work. Uh, it's no good working on a project and then waking up you know, at the end of it and have nothing else to do. Uh, it's always good to keep the next thing in mind. Uh, the second lesson I took from it was, um, you know, everyone loves Steve Jobs, everyone loves Elon Musk, but you should probably look a bit further for your influences and for good stories and for heroes because... Like, as I said, very few people know about this guy. He's still alive. He's still a billionaire. He more or less invented the internet, and nobody knows his name. So it's uh, there's, there's a lot of people like that, I presume, out there who, if you just look a bit further, you might get some uh, some interesting uh, insight. And then, as I said, the book was published in, in um, 99. Um, so I had a look and see what happened to the companies he founded. Uh, you, you know, people have heard of Netscape, but Silicon Graphics went bankrupt or went uh, into liquidation when uh, the inevitable happened. He predicted it at the time. He said, if you want a lot of money in Silicon Valley, do something that's of no interest to Microsoft because Microsoft will just come after you. And the PC and the ad the advent of the PC and the, the growth of the power of the PC basically just overtook his specialized silicon or graphics, his 3D graphics companies. Um, that went into liquidation. Netscape at the start of the story, Netscape had 85%, 90% of the browser market. By the two years later, it was 50-50 with Microsoft, and Microsoft were eating up the browser market. So uh, they sold Netscape, or Netscape was bought by AOL. And as you know, AOL didn't kind of last long either. Mm -hmm. it got take, consumed by Time Warner. So Netscape just got sucked into the corporate uh, black hole. And then the last one, Healthion. Healthion never really did it, what it was supposed to do. You know, they had they signed up a lot of doctors. They connected uh, prescription writing, the kind of automated prescription writing. Uh, it never did the big thing it was supposed to do. It ended up being merged with WebMD, which uh, I think had a Microsoft had a shareholding in it because he he knew that again Microsoft would come after Microsoft were getting into travel they were getting into entertainment and he said they're going to come after healthcare eventually so um, um, so the third lesson is that you know when you're looking for your success you might not be very happy or you might be thinking things aren't going great but a lot of your success could be in the past and you know it's inevitable that there's swings and roundabouts and there's peaks and troughs and uh, there's nothing wrong with having a success in the past because you can look forward and see can you recreate it mm. so um, that's the end of my little talk I hope it was interesting <laughs> We've, I, I'm sure there's questions I have one or two but um, go on <clears throat> uh, I actually looked them up online while you were talking as well so that's why I was got a uh, a bit distracted he seems to have an interesting um an interesting character uh and some interesting pictures there as well of um i think multiple girlfriends and wives that are his third wife yeah a lot younger than him uh but um he's a silicon valley billionaire yeah exactly um do you think the second point you said like look for your heroes that aren't that obvious and stuff but is that his was that by design? Do you think that he kept himself off the off the kind of media radar? Uh, because you know, like the other lads you mentioned, like Musk and whatnot, they tend to uh, enjoy yeah. it a bit. Maybe reading the book and reading, as I said, reading it now and look because it was written in ninety nine, so it was written about the late nineties. He seemed to um, uh, what's the word? 
coach or not coach. But, um, he seemed to look for attention in the media. He was on mm. the front of Fortune magazine. He was um, like when he was worth three billion. He was saying, "I want to be richer than Larry Ellison, who was worth eight billion." Like he he was this in the stratosphere of maybe maybe he was a big fish in Silicon Valley, and maybe in those days Silicon Valley wasn't as important as it is now in the global, uh, you know, mm. culture. Mm. But I think in, in America, in, in tech, he was huge at the time. Uh, what's surprising is that how quickly he was forgotten. You know? Yeah. It's probably the forgotten part, I think. Uh, yeah. Just on your first point as well, John, you were talking about the goals and, and, you know, always good to have goals like when you put a goal out are you always very clear on why you're doing it you know because the why of the goal is very important and you know than just having a goal um personally uh yeah i, I kind of tend to have projects um and i i tend to not have open-ended projects i tend to have projects with final uh with endpoints so, uh, but do you know what I'm, what I'm saying? Like, why is like you have a project that is going to deliver X, Y, and Z? But <clears throat> what is the motivations behind doing that project or that goal? You know, what what do you hope to get out of it? You know, that, I suppose at a an emotional level, even do you kind of think yeah, through yeah, that? Yeah. Um, maybe I just don't think that deeply. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this whole book club is about to get you thinking deeper, yeah. but. I know I think I like I know at work uh you know there's there's two types of project there's the one that earns the, the crust and pays the bills um and then there's the kind of the growth uh development project so that would be you know getting into a new field of engineering or trying to get certified on a new piece of technology which is you know trying to trying to keep moving not not to not to stay stagnant um and then personally in my spare time I be I'd be the same. I, I look for um, something that will interest me, um, uh, fulfill me personally, and then I always I, I tend to, to to move back and forth between something that I'm interested in and then something that will help my career. So I, you know, I try to mix it up. But would the buzz for you be the journey of that, say the the studying and the, the yeah. assignments, rather than getting your um, certificate at the end? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, the journey. Yeah, because uh, I just finished the masters there in uh, UCD and uh, handed in the last assignment last week, and won't see the class until December because we were all kicked out of the college in March, and we uh, we won't graduate till December. But um, that's fine. It was the, it was learning along the way that uh, hmm. that was the enjoyment. But I think a two year course like that is it, you need stepping stones to mm. keep yourself motivated mm -hmm. yep totally just get back to the book there um, John like yep. what what would you say made him a success like what how, how come he succeeded where a lot of other people have failed um well he was obviously gifted the fact that he was able to um you know the initial work he did on the on the chip and you know he obviously had talent uh but i think he uh, by the looks of it as rob alluded to with his many wives and girlfriends i think he sacrificed a lot for his success according to the story that you know, he he would um he'd have a very short attention span okay. uh he uh he tolerated uh he, he got bored very quickly mm -hmm. so there's, like you know there's a lot of references to him going to meetings with investors and suits or whatever, and kind of walking out of the meeting, you know, always sitting by the door. Um, um, he was learning to fly helicopters and he, he kind of hired a pilot to teach him, but he never listened. He more or less taught himself and got bored very quickly with that, you know, so um, I'd say he was restlessness. I'd say talent and restlessness meant that he could never stop. Um, so that, that's probably the reason why he was able to see the next step and see the next step. Yeah, because it was particularly visionary out of him, like all all his. Yeah, 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 yeah. And in a very short period of time, like in about five or seven years, all this happened. Yeah. Like when he went to Holland to build the boat, the the 
the the Royal Heisman Boat Company. I'd never heard of them. As I said, I'm not into sailing, but apparently it's a multi generational. Uh, you know, the guy that designed this boat, it was his great grandfather who started the company. And when he turned up, I want you to build me a boat. It's going to cost a hundred, or it could cost a hundred and fifty million dollars. They said, "Who's this guy?" They looked him up, and uh, like the company Netscape was worth a billion dollars, but it was uh, eighteen months old. Yeah. Like yeah. he had achieved that much in that short a period of time. Wow. Mm. I'm just again <clears throat> on Google clicking, looking for him under the news category, and it's mad for a guy that that is that's worth that much. There's not a whole lot about him in the last number of years, you know. Yeah, he can can. Must have. Keep well under the radar. Yeah. So he's James H. Clark because there was a Formula One driver in the sixties, Jim Jim Clark. He's probably more famous mm. Scottish guy that died young. But um yeah, he's James Clark. What's he what did he do after his third company? Um he started uh well the boat was completely there's the stories about the boat are mad because he wanted to computerize everything. So he had this rack of computers in the boat and he had touch screens everywhere. Um, and he controlled not only the sailing and the navigation, but the the lights and the temperature and the fridges and everything. So he tried to develop that into a, a household automation company. Like before smart homes, he wanted to you know, automate the household. That didn't really take off. Uh, then he had so much money uh, that he... He didn't trust stockbrokers. He didn't trust accountants. So he started a company called My CFO, which, which again, was like a computer-based money management company. Um, he, he got involved in a few other small companies, but he never got, had the success. I imagine I imagine he, uh, chances of him coming up with a fourth <laughs> billion-dollar company were just yeah, slim. But I think, how old is he? Is Rob, is he on? Have you got him there? Is he 75 or something? He was born He's in 1944, it said here, so he must be... He's 76, yeah. Mm. So, He's not an old person. Yeah. Mm. It sounds that it's like there's definitely similar characteristics or personality traits to, from what you described to him as there is with, say, Steve Jobs and... Yeah. And others that have that kind of short attention span that just can't sit still. That you know is always thinking about the next thing. I would imagine as well. That Absolutely, um yeah. seem to seem to. And when I hear about that and do research and kind of doing stuff around neurodiversity and the kind of that spectrum of of um you know the different neurodivergent talent or, or uh, attributes that people have, you kind of almost say some of these guys are have touches of some sort of. ADHD or, you know, yeah, other, yeah. other Well, one thing he did look at, I think, or after the last company was uh, he tried to invest, or, uh, yeah, to try to fund research in biocomputing. Um, I think somebody, he saw somebody in the early 2000s that had grafted uh, cells, could have been chicken cells or something, onto a chip, and they were, they, they were trying to do this kind of bio-neural um, interface, um, and he probably and he got involved in that, but I don't think he tried to build a company. I think he more funded research in colleges. Mm. Yeah, and that that whole neural, <clears throat> isn't it? Um, what's his name? Musk is like going to come out with a neural implant very soon. That's right, Jeff. That he's been yeah. talking about for the last while, but he reckons within five years you won't have to actually talk. That all your thoughts will be connected into. Well, it'll be decoded into the the chip and that'll come out on your screen or whatever so yeah yeah i heard him talk about that and he he talks about a disc shaped device that would be implanted in your skull uh but uh i don't know why it needs to be in your skull why he can't connect it wirelessly to uh something in your pocket i don't know because of the matrix he saw the matrix He he wants you to be kind of like that i'd say (laughs) <laughs> well he said basically your pocket you're already your mobile phone is already uh like you know it's just the same thing it's just implanting yeah. it so you don't actually have to and then it can probably be connected in re, you know real time into whatever um thought network. consciousness or whatever ne- yeah network there so it's mm. it's mad stuff very that's good insane. that's crazy stuff <laughs> 
It's mad. It's wild. You see Apple today on the on their the Apple Watch. They're about washing your hands. You see this? It was I heard on the radio this morning that Apple will, will be able to detect when you're washing your hands, and if you if you stop earlier than twenty seconds, they'll tell you you have to keep continue washing your hands. How they do it is is movement, and believe it or not, the noise of soap. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what? How do they detect the noise of soap? It's, that's insane. But it's it's along the same lines of being able to do what we just spoke about there. It's crazy. Mm. Yeah, sounds like it. I know I'm a type one diabetic, and I bought the watch a few years ago because was, there was potential where the um, the back of the watch could read the through your skin the level of hydration in in you to tell, and that can then detect your sh- blood sugar levels. They, they they hired a bunch of PhD guys in the US a few years ago to try and create a team to to focus in on that. They haven't haven't come out with anything yet, but um, it wouldn't surprise me if that's kind of part oh. of part of the plan. Rob, have you ever interviewed uh, Pat Phelan? You know, trust Dev from Cork. I haven't. No, I know. I don't. I know of him. Yeah, I don't know him though. No, because uh, I th- he's been. I, I follow him on Twitter, and he's been using this uh, implant that measures your blood sugars real time. Uh, you- and he's been kind of. Uh, he's been looking at. He's been posting after exercise and after taking an energy bar and so on. And mm, you can get this. Um- so like you can get a a diabetic pump and then there's also um there's this patch you can kind of click up, put on your 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 shoulder or whatever and there's a, like it I think it's an Abbott patch it's two it lasts for two weeks and it uh can send real time information of your blood sugar levels to to an app on your phone um okay. and <clears throat> the big thing for what what diabetics are hoping will come at some point soon is where that will talk with a, if you are wearing a pump. I do normal manual injections, but if you have a diabetic pump and you have the patch, you'll create a kind of a closed loop uh, pancreas, effectively a bionic pancreas that they'll talk to each other and they, re, they will one will release. It'll tell you when your sugar levels are too high, so it'll release insulin and and regulate. Yeah. Um, and you can you can create that. I think <clears throat> using open source. The software that you can kind of, I don't know, APIs and whatnot, but um, the big compo- companies haven't come out with that t- them talking to each other yet. And there's concerns around security that if, I remember Theresa May, <clears throat> when she was a diabetic or is a diabetic, that um, the example of if you could hack into that and you could uh, basically tell it that the sugar levels are too high and release insulin you could kill the person because uh, yeah 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 you could hack th- it yeah so there's security concerns around it but yeah it's so all, looking all there, he, he seems to be an investor in something called get gluk uh and i've seen him posting about it so yeah mm, interesting i must look it up it, touch, it touches on this moment uh you know the book that john mentioned maybe a month ago bad blood Oh, yeah, I read yeah, that one. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's about um, so John, John, if you can, it's about uh, Silicon Valley, uh, the first female billionaire, and how it's it's amazing. There's a Netflix documentary about yeah. it as well about the company. It's called The Inventor, and it's a, Almost how you fake it, you make it in Silicon Valley, but it's in med, it's in med devices, so you can't really do that. And it's just about the. She did a good job of faking it in a long time. <laughs> yeah, Jamie, it sounds like you're putting your hand up for the next book review. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, um, I... I think it's been put up for you there, Jamie. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. good time. <laughs> yeah. You can come up with the book, whatever book you want, I guess, Jamie. But uh, it'd be great <laughs> to have you along in in two weeks. Yeah, I suppose um, I suppose I have no choice of that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll have to, I'll have to, I'm back training, but I'll have to skip training that night. But uh, yeah, I can. Yeah. Good man. I think I have somebody lined up for the 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 one after that. So um, if you're good with it, uh, Jamie, we'll. All you have to do, what Mark had sent, sent me, or not Mark, but um, John had sent me a picture of the book and just a picture of yourself, and I can put it out in the next week or so. But uh, have a Take take some time to think about what book you want to do. Yeah, I love to think. 
Very good, guys. Well, will we leave it there? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Thanks, so much. Thanks, for that, Thanks for that, John. You would yeah, just John, just John, John, before he goes, does he have any other uh, books similar to the Bad Blood one? Because I, I was, uh, thought that was a great read. Um, that was recommended to me by a guy at work, and I again, I'd never heard of her. Uh, Elizabeth, was it? Holmes, yeah. Fascinating book. Um, I don't know what I have similar. Uh, around the same time, I, oh yeah, I think I, hang on. It's like a public library. <laughs> I was at work the last time, I didn't have these, but uh, if you've, uh, have you seen the Chernobyl documentary? Yeah. I'm yeah. watching it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the, the Chernobyl miniseries. Yes. So, yeah. uh, this is a book by a Russian author called uh, Serhii Plokai. It's um, it's a great book. It tells the full story, like minute by minute, oh. uh, into the disaster. It's fascinating. And the other one I was recommending a couple weeks ago is this one, Blowout. Um, it's about the oil industry in particular the Russian influence on the global oil market and how they've kind of pressurized the Ukraine and fixed prices and, uh, but also the fracking, the whole fracking industry in America and how that came out of nowhere and the companies that took advantage of that. So that's a, that's, she's a, an MSNBC, um, presenter. She's on every night on MSNBC. Perfect. Thanks. So that'll conclude. And of course, uh, Michael Lewis. Don't forget Michael Lewis. <laughs> I, I gave him to my dad for, for uh, Father's Day. <laughs> Partly a present for myself, I think. But, uh... <laughs> Very good. All right, lads, we we leave it there. That's another uh, John O'Sullivan book club night uh, done. Um, <laughs> no, thanks a million, John. It was great. It was interesting and no definitely good to get a different perspective, a different type of uh, book club review tonight, which is always good. Keep a variety coming. Thanks a million. Yep. And no Jamie, problem. we'll talk to you in two weeks and hopefully we'll have everybody along then. And a few, actually Fabio from Italy had sent me a note earlier saying, sorry, he couldn't make it tonight. He enjoyed the last one a lot. So hopefully he'll, he'll be back and, and others too, as we keep tipping away with it. Excellent. Great stuff, guys. Look Thanks after yourselves. I'll talk See to you, you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.